All right, so our next presenter is Dr. Sai Cortier. He's an aquaculture scientist and chair of the aquaculture programs for the Fisheries and Marine Institute of Memorial University in Newfoundland uh, to talk about what's been going on in Canada and their economic or in their aquaculture development plans. All right, Sire, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for calling me Sire. It's actually Sear, but that's <laughs> that's okay. Can you hear me and see me? Yes, presence. I can. I can hear you. I can see you, and I can see your presentation. Perfect. All right. So, uh, what I'd like to do today is just give you a, a short update of, of agriculture developments uh, in Canada, and uh, and then uh, top it off with uh, what our future goals are in terms of the the whole sector in the country. Uh, I do have a background in uh, as a marine biologist, and I've uh, been conducting uh, research for a long time. Uh, however, development type research, but in the last 15 years, I would say most of my efforts uh, as an academic been more in the public policy and science interface as well as in the advocacy side. So I am a past president of the National Seafood Farmers Association, Canadian Agriculture Industry Alliance, and uh, as well as some regional boards. So we work on behalf of the, the industry and we want the industry to grow. So. Today, it's Canada's seafood farming development, getting back to growth. Next slide, please. So in Canada, basically, uh, we do have farming in, uh, in all 10 provinces uh, and one territory uh, that, that would be up in the top left-hand corner. And uh, most of the farming of seafood is on the right coast, meaning the, uh, <laughs> the right side of the Northwest Atlantic. Um, with five provinces involved, principally four Atlantic provinces, Newfoundland, Labrador, the Maritimes, Quebec, uh, some uh, concentrated farming in uh, Ontario, uh, and salmon and, and other and shellfish and seaweed on the west coast here in British Columbia, and a little bit up in the Yukon. Uh, we've been farming seafood in Canada since pre-Confederation, so before 1867 when uh, oyster farming was taking place, was also uh, uh, trout and salmon, and in fact, our colleagues, our Norwegian colleagues, uh, uh, were in were in Newfoundland, where I'm physically located, uh, in the 1880s, and uh, and involved with um, cod stock enhancement trials, and uh, so we've we've learned a lot uh, from our Norwegian friends, and uh, they've been here. Well, they came visiting uh, North America about a thousand years ago, so. We'll leave it at that. Next. Okay, so this is sort of uh, the distribution of uh, farming by species and province. And uh, in Canada, uh, if you go to the far left, uh, this is in terms of thousands of tons. In 2018, the production was just under 20,000 tons, consisting mostly of salmon, Atlantic salmon in Newfoundland, Labrador. Prince Edward Island uh, was slightly higher than this, consisting mostly of farmed mussels. Uh, we go to Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, uh, a little bit higher, consisting mostly of Atlantic salmon, uh, not too much in between. Uh, and then you get to the west coast of Canada and you have a large production of, uh, of Atlantic salmon in the Pacific, as well as um, um, some shellfish, oysters, cohogs. So finfish is the largest proportion in Canada of uh, farm seafood uh, of a variety of species. Salmon in particular, Atlantic, Chinook and Coho are grown on each coast. They make up 64% of the production by weight, 80% of the production by value in 2014, 2018. Mussels, trout uh, are the second and third most valuable aquaculture farms in, uh, in rec recent years. Oysters are up there as well. I think we'll go to the next one, please. Next slide. Thank you. So as you may or may not know, trade is an important consideration uh, uh, between Canada and the US in particular. And uh, we are your, whether it's preferred or uh, most reliable trading partner, uh, depends on which uh, federal government uh, uh, politicians are in power, I guess. Uh, but our trade in aquaculture has been growing. Uh, 
between 2014 and 2018. And uh, a lot of it is due to mostly the salmon, but also we trade a lot in, in, uh, in shellfish, a little less, and uh, we don't import as much uh, as, we, uh, as we trade. One minute. We do farm uh, 27 different species of different levels in the country. And uh, so some of the more up and coming ones, uh, well, they're clams, scallops, uh, some aquatic plants, seaweeds, as well as sea urchins, uh, shrimp, actually marine shrimp, and uh, sea cucumbers are also uh, produced in small amounts. Next, please. Well, this is the sad story of aquaculture development in, in Canada. Uh, things were going pretty good starting in the 1980s uh, when commercial production of, of shellfish and some fin fish started. Uh, and uh, it grew fairly rapidly uh, up until about the year 2000. And then we've, uh, we've hit a basically, a, we've flatlined since then. Uh, so that's the context that we're speaking about today. And uh, in the last 13 or 14 year, years, effectively, we have flatlined. And we should have lots of opportunity to grow, but uh, there are a number of reasons why we haven't made that. And in fact, if we're just talking about uh, salmon production, uh, we were leaders in the 80s and 90s, North, and, uh, but we've lost to other jurisdictions, uh, besides Norway has always been the leader, but uh, Chile, United Kingdom, uh, in particular. So uh, currently we sit uh, fourth on the global stage, but only accounting for a very small production uh, amount globally. Next. Our markets, as you may or may not know, uh, uh, about 85% are, are, um, are to the United States or North America. Uh, remainder is in Asia and Europe, uh, about 25 different countries. Uh, about 70% is food service and restaurants, 30% retail, pre-COVID. Uh, for salmon production, expansions are planned still in uh, Newfoundland, some in Nova Scotia, and hopefully in British Columbia, if the regulatory frame is more available in the future, innovations are forthcoming. Next. Yeah, so just to put it in context, available surface area, uh, or oceanic area, not even offshore, but uh, inshore. Uh, if you look at the at this particular slide, Canada has about uh, 80,000 kilometers of coastline, 50,000 nautical miles or miles. Uh, the US about 20,000. Uh, and you you produce on average, uh, almost 10 tons. Uh, is it 10 tons? Yeah, 10 tons per, uh, per, per uh, kilometer. We produce two Norwegians, even with their um, spatial utilization, produce about 50 tons. Uh, Chile, it's 160 tons. So we still have lots of room to grow, lots of space. We occupy fish, seafood farmers occupy less than 1% of the available space in Canada. Next. Total economic benefits in a, sna in a, in a snapshot. Uh, so it's about $1.4 billion Canadian, which is about half that in American dollars. Um, 1.4 billion Canadian uh, in sort of landed value, farm gate value. Uh, when you add all of the other economic benefits, the sector is worth roughly $5.3 billion in 2018. And there's a whole value chain, as you might imagine. Most, if not all, seafood farmers, uh, whether it's shellfish or finfish, are integrated in, into the value chain from uh, egg to plate, I guess, if you want to say that. Many of the larger companies, in particular the, uh, the salmon companies and some of the oyster companies and mussel companies uh, that make up the bulk of the production in Canada uh, are integrated from egg to plate, from the hatchery all the way to, to the final market. So um, we have a complex, uh, the main the main constraints really for growth are um, we have a, a complicated set of regulations that restrict growth and limit investment uh, to a large extent. Ragnar pointed out that uh, the uh, you know at the municipal, regional, county versus uh, province and federal level, 
Uh, there are regulations all along the road uh, and across mu multiple jurisdictions, provincial and federal jurisdictions. Um, and it's complex for people to get involved in this. And uh, and uh, you have to have a, a lot of stamina. So it's regulated both federally and provincially. Um, and it's a shared jurisdictional uh, uh, responsibility in coastal waters uh, up to about the 12 nautical mile uh, limit. So uh, after that, if we were to go offshore past 12 nautical miles, uh, it would be strictly a federal responsibility. So that is one of the parts. Uh, the, we, it's regulated at the federal level, principally by the Fisheries Act, which is a, an act created 150 plus years old, hasn't changed a whole lot, and doesn't even mention the word aquaculture or seafood farming in there. Uh, Okay, just to say it's complex, as complex as it is in Norway. Next. Um, but it was recognized uh, just a couple of years ago in 2018 from uh, an economic table uh, from the finance minister, our, our, our wonderful finance minister at the federal level that is gone uh, now, resigned a few months ago, uh, that it actually, uh, it provides the greatest economic op opportunity uh, for Canadian agri-foods, uh, both aquaculture and agriculture, uh, to increase uh, the value for food security and exports and uh, and all those sorts of things for Canadian economy. Uh, that was, uh, and we could we could see really the potential for increasing, doubling the production from 200,000 tons to almost 400,000 tons over a 10 year period, if a sustainable development plan was, was put forward. Next. Part of the development plan uh, that is being proposed now, uh, basically will also involve indigenous reconciliation and the Canadian uh, aquaculture industry is intimately involved with, uh, with indigenous reconciliation in the fact that over 250 First Nations uh, are engaged in seafood farming across Canada. Significant ownership and partnerships in uh, several provinces, a half a dozen provinces or more. 80% of the production in British Columbia, for example, is covered by agreements with First Nations and committed to having 100% agreements in, in their lands and territories by 2022. 20% of the fish farm jobs in British Columbia are held by Indigenous peoples, and we've had recent groundbreaking agreements uh, that will allow for further expansion and development of aquaculture if we can get the federal house in order. Next. The current situation is that the federal, uh, our, our new government, the uh, renewed government, I guess, if you will, the Liberals, or your equivalent of the Democrats uh, about a year ago, uh, have a new fisheries minister and, and is given the charge to look at two things uh, respect, with respect to aquaculture. One is the Blue Economy uh, Initiative, and I think Oyvind uh, mentioned this quite nicely when they, it's about oil and gas, marine transportation, fisheries and aquaculture. And uh, we're taking our lead a little bit from that. We're, uh, that initiative, so thank you. Uh, but basically, the minister is supposed to look at uh, the blue economy, undertake public consultations, and, and have inputs there uh, to see how we're going to either grow or, or not grow the aquaculture industry, as well as an aquaculture act. So the National Association has provided a briefing uh, plan and a plan for the blue economy initiatives on seafood. So not just aquaculture, but farm seafood and uh, capture fee seafood to sort of give us a five year uh, horizon, a renewable horizon for the next 20 years to 2040. Uh, so not the 2050 plan that uh, that uh, Ragnar is mentioning, but uh, but at least a 2040. And all of this will meld into our, our requirements, uh, Canadian requirements and hopes to uh, get to net zero by, let's say, 2050, in terms of climate change and impacts. Next. The federal 
the framework for sustainable growth that uh, is being presented and will be presented to government uh, and, and provincial and federally by the Canadian Agriculture Industry Alliance, which uh, I'm representing here today. Um, basically, we, we don't have a federal champion for aquaculture anywhere in the country. So if you want the sector to grow, you have to have somebody uh, to be responsible for it. So we've been arguing uh, that you have to identify a champion uh, for the for the growth and development. Uh, it can be the Department of Agriculture, uh, like the U.S. Department of Agriculture may be in the United States, um, uh, uh, but Fisheries and Oceans, uh, which also has a conservation and uh, mandate, uh, wants to keep that. So uh, maybe we'll get the development mandate back into Fisheries and Oceans. It hasn't hasn't been there for over 30 years. Um, our federal department of, uh, of fisheries and oceans gave up development mandate for seafood uh, over 30 years ago with any luck they'll get it they'll take it back or get some resources uh, we need to develop a sustainable growth plan so not untoward but a reasonable growth plan and and i think you would agree that uh, if if it's uh, over a 20 year period to double production uh, that's not huge uh, so that needs to be there. Need to establish an Aquaculture Act, uh, basically that outlines the federal and provincial responsibilities, uh, streamlines the regulatory process. We have 83 different agencies and pieces of legislation uh, regulating aquaculture in, the, in this country. That's horrendous. How do you navigate all of that, even if you're a small uh, finfish or shellfish farmer? Um, so that needs to be streamlined. Achieve competitive access to fish health and innovative feed products. I think uh, Ragnar already mentioned some of those uh, uh, as well. Uh, and modernize the Canadian Shelf Sanitation Program. That's the equivalent of your uh, uh, NSSP. Uh, ours is not modernized, and we need to modernize it to make it more effective uh, for producers. Next. So we're working on this uh, blue economy strategy uh, with government, uh, uh, not just as an advocate, but uh, but uh, as active participants uh, to try and help the minister uh, and the government, federal government, uh, come up with their plan. It will, of course, consult with others, uh, the seafood sector, as well as the, uh, um, the oil and gas and other, other areas. But our goals are to try and double the value of Canadian seafood, value, double economic benefits to Canadians, and double domestic consumption of fish and seafood. So we've pretty much got a rough idea what the plan might look like, but it's a matter of getting uh, achievable specific targets uh, that can, can benefit all Canadians. Next. So uh, just, a, just a quick uh, thing on, on COVID impacts on production, and um, it, it has been a step back. Uh, in this whole process of uh, regulatory reform and, and advancing growth. Uh, you know, we've had show, I don't need to tell you, you've heard lots already, uh, but the shellfish sector has rebounded somewhat. The finfish sector has rebounded a fair amount. Everybody's pivoted towards uh, different, uh, different uh, ways of doing business e-commerce, at-home deliveries, all of this sort of stuff uh, is, is going on. And there's been a small amount of government support in the value chain for aquaculture. Uh, and it's very much appreciated, uh, particularly in the areas of uh, uh, health and safety uh, in the processing plants and those sorts of things. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that we haven't had any issues in Canadian uh, farm seafood uh, processing plants with, uh, with this COVID stuff. Next. On the innovation side, just to give you a couple of quick updates, and uh, you may be aware of these, but uh, the closed, semi-enclosed containment at sea and land uh, issues that uh, Ragnar mentioned uh, are de definitely being developed also in Canada by Norwegian-based, or I should say Japanese-based, if you're talking about CERMAC, uh, Mitsubishi, but uh, uh, CERMAC, Grieg, Cook, Aquaculture, Moe are all developing 
these new enhanced uh, land-based or semi-enclosed based facilities for larger smolts. Uh, alternative feed ingredients have been developed uh, for proteins and oils. One of the first ones to come up with insect meal was actually a company founded by a former graduate student in uh, Vancouver uh, to come up with a trout uh, insect meal uh, uh, to sell to the U.S. trout producers. It took us another five years to get an approval to put it in our trout in Canada uh, by, by the regulatory agency, which is kind of silly, but anyway. Uh, so I hope there's no Canadian colleagues here uh, <laughs> online. Uh, a lot of the camelina, high the unsaturated fatty acids, it's now produced in uh, Cargill's, uh, uh, Cargill's uh, uh, I don't know if it's Idaho or one of their production facilities there. Um, we're developing Canadian uh, prairie lands and with Memorial University. And we're also looking at a variety of other feed ed, uh, 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 replacements for oils and proteins. Cleaner fish and parasite for sea lice control is definitely a big issue here and in Norway. Uh, not having a lot of success to date, uh, but there's still hope that the, that the will be part of the solution and the tools to combat parasites at sea, as well as larger smolts and, and a variety of, and integrated pest management approach. Vaccine development for cleaner fish and production fish is, is ongoing. It's a arduous, long process. And we really need a, mum, a mums uh, process for minor use, minor uh, uh, drugs and pesticides uh, for use in aquaculture. Hello, next. Additional innovations that uh, you will see coming out of Canada and elsewhere, Norway and so on, are uh, uh, for fish health, uh, include uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning for biomass control, environmental performance, sea lice uh, regulation. Lots of these innovations are coming out of Canadian companies, but also others. Uh, ocean technology and cage design, of course, uh, uh, we'll be trying some different Norwegian varieties here, but uh, develop some neat ones here for uh, plankton mitigation um, in, on the West Coast. Um, climate adaptation strategies also uh, in terms of breeding stocks to uh, our waters are quite different from the East to the West Coast for farming salmon and have different impacts on the shellfish and the finfish on those coasts. So. Uh, working with some regulatory, uh, some researchers and uh, trying to come up with innovative solutions on that, as well as create a couple of new hatcheries uh, for shellfish on the East Coast. Go ahead. Okay, before I conclude, the only other thing I wanted to say about uh, innovation is that generally speaking in Canada, uh, we haven't supported uh, R&D and, and innovation financially. Uh, from all the institutions uh, up until recently. Um, it's been a real mixed bag of different institutions and provincial federal governments and academics and government researchers, unlike the Norwegian model. Uh, but we did come up with uh, uh, something called the Ocean Super Cluster about three years ago. And uh, that's an innovation cluster for uh, for aquaculture, seafood, and other uh, ocean technologies, where industry and government uh, par partner to come up with innovative solutions to address challenges in, for example, aquaculture. We also have a funded Ocean Frontier Institute that looks at science, technology, and social uh, dimensions of seafood, uh, farming, or, or culture, and environment. And that one is uh, mostly uh, academically driven. And there's also on the east coast of Canada, the Atlantic Fisheries Fund, which is managed by our equivalent of uh, Innovation Norway, uh, Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency, which uh, does similar things on marketing innovation. And uh, that is for mostly for seafood, uh, I like to call it seafood greening and innovation. So small scale seafood stuff. Uh, to conclude, uh, we have renewed federal and provincial engagement. Uh, we do need re renewed federal and provincial engagement on regulatory reform. As you may imagine, uh, our structure is a little bit different than the U.S., but 
federally and provincially, um, they also run by party alliances. So Republican and Democrats versus uh, 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 liberals and and uh, and others. And uh, and we need everyone to get their act together and uh, streamline the regulations uh, and get a renewed interest in. Uh, most of the provinces are interested in uh, increasing aquaculture. Uh, we need to get the federal government on side and to talk to the provinces about that. We need more uh, support for the development strategy as well as uh, dollars, R&D and innovation. And these asks have all been made uh, across the board. We must participate in the blue economy strategy. It's the only way we're gonna meet some of our, uh, our uh, targets. United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and we'll we partner with Norway and uh, maybe even the U.S. if there's a blue economy strategy in the U.S. And there is an imperative for seafood production to be more sustainable uh, in the long term. It's important for Canadians and seafood farmers make a major contribution to food security in our country, so that'll be part of it. I think I will close there. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. We've had uh, one question uh, come yeah. up so far uh, from Bobby Hudson, and she'd like to know, she said, when discussing impacts of COVID-19 on Canadian seafood production, your slide stated reduced recruitment and retention of farm workers. Can you please comment on why that is or your opinion as to why that it's happening now? Well, initially, there's been an ongoing problem with uh, recruitment of farm workers, uh, period. And the labor gap, uh, in seafood farming, it's principally from uh, from uh, Canadians, but there is some amount in the value chain and the processing that comes from uh, foreign labor, primarily Mexicans. But the uh, uh, in the seafood side of things, uh, farmed or wild, uh, Many, many people uh, just didn't want to go to work in the processing sector or on the farms until there was some secure measure uh, of, of a reoccurrence. So what farmers had to do, because production was delayed anyway, uh, is boost wages, which is a good thing. <laughs> that can be used in recruitment. So we're just not back up there because the whole, uh, you know, the production has been delayed. Uh, markets have uh, been uh, disrupted and uh, when we do get back up to speed whenever that is uh, I think what we're going to see actually over the next year and a half is a lot more bankruptcy some consolidation in the industry both shellfish and fin fish uh, and uh, and just a whole new uh, sector um, revised sector so um, Recruitment is always an issue in rural areas. Somebody mentioned this in the one of the earlier talks uh, of the country. And if you don't pay uh, highly skilled uh, youth uh, to, to recruit to a, to a sector that's mostly rural um, and have the infrastructure, you're not gonna recruit them there. So, um, so we basically increased the bar. I think the industry's had to increase the bar on, on, on that. And that increases your cost of production, uh, in addition to uh, in addition to uh, trying to battle all the health challenges. So farmers have to find a solution for that. And uh, I also work. I'm chair of a national council on the Canadian Agriculture Human Resource Council, and we look at these specific items. Um, for primary agriculture, including aquaculture in the country. So we can go offline and talk about that if you wish. Okay, thank you. There's one more question about regulatory costs and I'll assign that one to you in the question box so that we can move on with Dr. Van Senten's um, Perfect. presentation.